Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Dan Malthrop, Chief Executive here, also a proud member. And I'm honored to welcome all of you here today to our conversation with a local hero, Dr. Alex Johnson, <laughs> President of Cuyahoga Community College. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. So we'll get into Dr. Johnson's story by and by, but let me just share a few, a few uh, details here. More than 25 years of experience as a college president, the last seven of which have been here in Greater Cleveland leading Cuyahoga Community College. In this role at Tri-C, he serves more than 60,000 students each year and has graduated a record number. On July 1st, he became chair of the American Association of Community Colleges. For the, long, for the year long term, he leads 32 board members for the principal community college advocacy organization in the country, representing about 1,200 schools. And prior to this role at the AACC, he chaired their Committee on Community College Advancement and co-chaired the Implementation Committee for the Commission's report, Reclaiming the American Dream. He's on boards of national organizations, including the Association of American Colleges and Universities, and locally he serves on the boards of United Way Greater Cleveland, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Ideastream, Playhouse Square, the Greater Cleveland Partnership. And Dr. Johnson is also the author of Change the Lapel Pin, Personalizing Leadership, and to transform organizations and communities for sale here today, mm -hmm. where he reflects on his 25 years of experience and discusses the leadership strategies that have led to his success. Prior to coming to Tri-C, Dr. Johnson was president of the Community College of Allegheny County, chancellor of Delgado Community College, president of the Pennsylvania Commission for Community Colleges, and served on the Governor's Advisory Commission on Post-Secondary Education. Esteemed guests, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming our friend, Dr. Alex Johnson. Thank you. Dr. Johnson, I want to start um, noting the, the passing last week of a, a really unparalleled leader in our community, Mort Mandel, who made a, some enormous contributions to higher education across Northeast Ohio and around the world, but specifically to Tri-C, and I know you worked closely with him um, during your tenure. And I wonder if you could just reflect a little bit on what his legacy is and what his, what his leadership meant to you. Well, well, thank you, Dan, for that question. And before I answer it, I just want to extend my sincere appreciation to all of you uh, for coming out and hearing about a great institution. This is not about me. It's not, I'm not, I'm not virtuous by any stretch of the imagination. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> and in fact, when you read my, uh, my bio, I said, wow, I have lived a very, very long time. <laughs> and then secondly, I can't keep a job. So I mean, what's the, <laughs> what's the big deal about you know, being here as a college president? But at any rate, um, Mr. Mandel uh, was um, among uh, those singular, in a, uh, singular uh, people um, in the world who make a true impact, uh, not only because of his philanthropy, but because of his commitment to educational excellence uh, through the humanities. Uh, and he not only showed that commitment here in the United States, and most notably Cleveland, but throughout the world. Uh, in Israel, for example, if you go there and you, um, you visit Jerusalem in particular, you will see the imprint of not only Mr. Mandel, but his brothers and his entire family. Uh, and for us, uh, we've had a decade-long relationship uh, with the Mandel Foundation, and I'm so delighted that our good friend Steve Hoffman is here to celebrate Mr. Mandel and also Joanne White, who has been my good friend for a very, very long time as well. Mr. Mandel's commitment, first and foremost, was ensuring that at Tri-C we had a professional development program uh, that would create 
uh, individuals who could succeed first and foremost at jobs at the institution and when possible take jobs outside of the institution to represent not only that training but also the institution very, very proudly indeed. The other thing that he's done is really made it possible for many students in this room to benefit from the power and the value of first scholarship, uh, academic development, and then civic engagement because that's what the Mandel Humanities Center does and uh, Mandel Scholars. How many Mandel Scholars do we have in the room today? Raise your hands high. Got a, we got, How many we have? We have one, but there are many, yeah. many more. They're probably right taking. They're probably in class, quite honestly. Yeah. <laughs> That's how studious yeah. they are. Yeah. And then the last piece he's done is he's 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 helped us accomplish is to ensure that as students transition, uh, as they complete their two-year experience, that they can transition seamlessly to Cleveland State University, for example, with full scholarship support in their honors college. Uh, so. Mr. Mandel's legacy is etched, uh, not only in the history of the institution, but in its future. And his book, and it's all about who, mm -hmm. uh, has helped us accomplish some of his aims and objectives related to his vision. So we are so delighted, Steve, uh, for your continued support. And Joanne, thank you once again for being our partner as well. So thank you for being here. Indeed, thank you. Thank you. Um, that, that idea that it's all about who. Right. Um, is incredibly important when it comes to leadership. Um, the, I want to ask you a little bit about your role as a leader in our community. I want to get to, we'll, we'll get to some Tri-C stuff in sure. a moment, but, I, but I, I'm really interested to hear from you on what it means to you to be a leader in Cleveland today, particularly in light of the, a speech that was given from this stage uh, a few months ago by Randy McShepard about the, the the report that Policy Bridge put out called Missing in Action. Right. Um, the, you and I have discussed it uh, at length, but I, I'd love to, <laughs> for you to talk a little bit more about it. Well, I thought it was, um, um, I read the report and I thought it was uh, important for people to understand that it's not about a dearth of, of African American leadership or leadership uh, from individuals of color. It is uh, about how do we continue uh, to create leadership opportunities for those individuals. Uh, about two years ago, back in 2017, we had the privilege of celebrating uh, the, 100, the 50th anniversary of Carl Stokes' election uh, as mayor of Cleveland, the first African-American uh, mayor of a major American city. Uh, we, ha we did that because I think part of our responsibility as a community was to ensure that we did not forget about an important moment in the history of our city. Mm -hmm. And that at that time, it was African American leadership that really, that was really at the forefront in mm -hmm. terms of ensuring that Cleveland's economic growth and development was, um, was evident and that we did a better job of eradicating some of the challenges that we first faced as a community at that time. The Mandel Humanity Center, along with other organizations, including the City Club, had an important role in leading that effort. Mm -hmm. So uh, before we actually launched it, I talked to Congressman Stokes. It was the last conversation that I had with him um, uh, uh, at, his favorite, uh, at his favorite restaurant, and the name escapes me right now. Did I hear somebody say it? Corky and Lenny's? No, no, not no. Corky and Lenny's. <laughs> okay, okay. That's what, that's don't don't, take, my, don't take my time with wrong answers now. Come on. <laughs> Either you know or you don't know. But I, I had a conversation with him. That much is true. And so um, I asked him, I said, what if we did this? What do you think about it? Because I wanted his permission. And he said, I think it's great. Carl would have loved the fact that his legacy lives on. It's being celebrated. As I went around, however, people said, well, you need to include uh, uh, Congressman Stokes in that as, as well. But he said to me, he said, he said, you know what? He said, I have a regret, and I'm going to share this with you. He said, we were so uh, committed uh, to focusing and developing our efforts that we forgot about you know, promoting uh, and cultivating the next wave of leadership. So we actually lost a generation of leadership in our community. Now, 
it's coming to the forefront. We have some individuals involved in the Stokes Leadership Institute that is uh, being um, delivered in collaboration with our Humanity Center and uh, Marion Crosley from the Cleveland Leadership Center. Uh, but now we're working toward ensuring that we don't miss that next generation. And as I look, uh, look uh, across the landscape, there's a lot of individuals who are coming to the pipeline who will be mm -hmm. taking on these, uh, these new leadership roles. So with respect to the report, it, was, it wasn't about the fact that black leadership is missing. It's just the fact that we are cultivating a new generation and we cannot miss out on doing that continually. So those of us who are prospective leaders, we need to make sure that our shoulders are strong enough uh, to leverage and support the next generation as well. You carry a, yeah, yeah. You, you carry a, a unique burden, um, particularly in your role um, at Tri-C. There's a lot, of, a lot of leaders who are coming up through Tri-C, but also in your, leader, in your national leadership role at the American Association of Community Colleges. Um, talk about how you're, how you're using that role right now, this national role. Um, you have a, a, a big bully pulpit to, to make use of. Well, I mean, I'm fortunate. Um, at our institution, we have any number of professional development programs inspired by uh, Mr. Mandel, first and foremost. And at the national level, at the American Association of Community Colleges, there are an endless number of professional development programs as well. Uh, many of our, uh, my colleagues participate in the Future Leadership Institute, which is um, uh, conducted by the American Association. There's the Future Presence Institute, and I happen to, have, uh, to be an instructor in both of those. And so I'm able to share with them the things that we have done here in an innovative fashion at Tri-C to help them understand perhaps, or to inspire them to understand what it is they need to do uh, to, to, uh, to promote excellence at their institutions and in their community. We know that community colleges are economic drivers uh, throughout the nation. Uh, that we not only uh, promote the workforce and create the workforce, but we also are in, must be involved uh, in the community and not only in civic, communi civic engagement, but also community development as conveners around those things that are truly important to our growth and development uh, in our communities and our neighborhoods. The other thing we need to understand is that we need to transform to accommodate the needs of a changing world. When we think about uh, the future of work, for example, the impact of technology alone is going to cause us to transform uh, in a significant way. So we need to be about the business of redefining ourselves, not only community colleges, but higher education generally. And if you think about our history, back in 2005, the Spelling Report um, indicated that higher education had lost, had lost touch with its missions. Mm -hmm. And then we have the American Graduation Initiative back in 2009. Mm -hmm. We were faltering as a system. We had fallen. Um, um, we had fallen with respect to um, uh, other countries that make up the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And we need to make sure that community colleges, in particular, help us regain our competitive edge as a nation. Russia graduated more students this past year than we did. We rank 14th out of the 39 nations, the countries of that organization that I just mentioned to you, the, o the OECD. Really? Yes. That's shocking. Yes. Uh, enrollment is an issue for higher ed institutions across the country right now. Um, and some have suspended operations even. Um, how's enrollment doing at Tri-C? Our enrollment is growing. Uh, this past year, we've, we saw an increase of about um, 2 percent, mm -hmm. um, and that's significant because what we've done is really uh, transform the institution to focus in a laser-like fashion on access. So where we are seeing a lot of our growth is in our workforce development, in our workforce development area through some of the programs that we've implemented there. Mm -hmm. uh, since about 2013, community colleges across the nations, their enrollment has declined significantly. 8% of 
for individuals below 24 and 27 percent for individuals over 24. And we've got to do a better job of ensuring that individuals who are currently employed in jobs that don't provide a family sustaining wage get an opportunity to get back to us to benefit from what we have to offer. And we're doing that through our access centers and some other uh, things that I will talk about later on. Um, the, the, it's really remarkable, given the, the national context of declining enrollment, that, um, that Tri-C is doing better than even flat. Yes. Two percent growth yes. is, is something to be very, very proud now, of. Now, we've, de we've declined. I'm not going to tell you that we have not over time, but now we are picking up students, which is an important, uh, I think, important, cha important change for us. Why is that? What, what do you attribute that to? Well, we're focusing uh, on um, workforce development, short-term training programs. In 2013, we graduated less than 1,000 individuals with workforce credentials. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, we awarded less than 1,000 short-term training workforce credentials. This past year, 19,000. Look at Michael smiling back there. Because <laughs> he knows what I'm about to say. We awarded 19,349. Oh my now, gosh. I, yeah, that's I need to make sure, I need to make sure that you understand. That means that we awarded multiple credentials to single individuals, in some instances four or five. But it means that they're competitive for job opportunities in each one of those areas. And those areas, guess what? Are high tech, high wage jobs that provide a family sustaining wage. And I'm not talking about $15 an hour. Yeah. I'm not talking about $15 an hour. I heard you. Okay. Okay. Because <laughs> $15 an hour will not provide a family with what they need in order to, uh, to live a quality life. Do you know how much it takes for a family of four to live a quality of life in Cuyahoga County in Cleveland? $65,000. That's what it takes. And this is, that's where we need to be as a community. And that's the only way that we're going to lessen that wage gap uh, uh, that exists in, in our uh, community today. Um, there's a, a number of people wearing uh, Tri-C, supporting the levy uh, stickers here today. And um, I would be remiss if uh, after that I didn't give you a chance to give your elevator pitch on the levy. Go ahead. Well, it's not an elevator pitch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, we live this every day, don't we, Claire? <laughs> so we, uh, how many of you remember Ruby McCullough? Raise your hands. Okay. So Ruby McCullough, a longstanding champion uh, of the community, a board member at Tri-C, uh, uh, used to say we pass a levy every day. And so Tri-C has to be on its game every day because levies now make up 48% of our revenue, make up 48% of our budget. Uh, so it's important that we continue to demonstrate our worthiness mm -hmm. uh, for those individuals who might continue to be interested in investing in us. Because of the levy, we're able to keep our education affordable. Students right now pay about 23% of what it actually costs to educate them. In Ohio, that percentage is between 45 and 50%, and across the nation, it's 60%. It also allows us to introduce programs that are attractive and in collaboration with the business community that we serve. Uh, that's important. And it also makes possible for us to purchase the needed equipment that would provide the training and education that individuals need to be successful immediately in the workforce. So the levy is important in that regard. It helps us to operate uh, continuously. This year, issue three is on the ballot, and we're seeking a, a renewal plus a 0.4 increase. Uh, for the average household, $100,000, that's about a dollar and 17 cents a month, a dollar and 17 cents a month uh, to ensure uh, that the institutions continue uh, to thrive and remains an economic driver for this mm -hmm. great community. So for your $14 a year, you're getting what if you're not at Tri-C? If you're not at Tri-C? If I'm not taking classes at Tri-C, and I'm not on the advisory board of the Mandel Humanities Center, which I am. Um, <laughs> but, but like you know, for the the the, the listener um, or the 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 
on in the, the voter who has not yet made up her mind? You know, I would be surprised if not everybody in Cuyahoga County has taken a class at Tri-C <laughs> or knows of someone that has taken a, tri a class at Tri-C and has intimate knowledge and understanding about the power and the value of a Tri-C experience. We have enrolled um, more, almost a million individuals since the college was founded back in 1963. Mm -hmm. We've graduated almost 100,000 individuals. So for those, uh, those folk who, um, who may not be interested in taking a class, I would encourage them to vote for the levy because of the return on investment. For every dollar invested in the institution, the return on investment is almost 10. The, for the average tax dollar, we get about five cent compared to the school systems, which get 61 cent. Mm -hmm. We retain 85% of those individuals that graduate from Tri-C and they go into the workforce and contribute to the tax base. So there's a lot of reasons for supporting Tri-C other than making certain that if you take a course, it's more affordable. It's about the betterment of the community. It's about the lasting value that an institution of our caliber uh, brings. And it's the impact on the ec economy, which is truly important. There was a moment uh, in the not too distant past that the idea you, of the You're community... not asking any of questions we, we agreed no. upon. I told you I wasn't going to. I told Claire, I told you. I mean, let's not, I just. Oh I'm my goodness. Constitutionally that's incapable. Okay. That's okay. I'm constitutionally that's okay. incapable of doing that. Okay. Um, <laughs> but the, there was a moment, don't worry, you're gonna, you're gonna love this question. Um, there was a moment when the idea of the community college was radical. What, like before we had Tri-C, there were no community colleges in the state of Ohio, and this right. idea that we should publicly fund the education, the higher education of people who might otherwise not be able to afford public education was, um, even public education, much less private education, was seen as a kind of a, it was a really new uh, and radical and innovative concept. Yeah. Um, talk about the role, well, that, we were, talk about that history a little bit. Well, um, Robert Lewis, Pat, right? Robert Lewis, how many times did he try to get the, um, uh, get the bill passed to establish uh, Cuyahoga Community College? He, I think he, he missed it the first time and the second time, so you're absolutely right. Uh, it was revolutionary, but it was during a time when, uh, following the Truman Report back in the 1948, uh, which recommended a, a network of community colleges across the nation, it was during a time when veterans were returning to Cleveland, when they needed affordable education. At that time, um, I don't think we had a, a public four-year institution in Cleveland, did we? We did not. Cleveland State was, they were, yeah, after us. So uh, it was a radical idea, but a much needed opportunity for individuals uh, to uh, access po post-secondary education. So it failed the first time. Uh, at the, at the state level. But once it was established, we had wholesome uh, and extensive support from the community, and we launched our first levy back in 1963, and that's when we were able to raise the funds to build our metropolitan campus and our western campus, uh, and ultimately the eastern campus, and now, now West Shore. It was revolutionary. Uh, during that time, the focus was on transfer programs. Uh, but now the focus is on a combination of transfer and workforce. Uh, and it's an important mission uh, that uh, community colleges have and that they need in order to promote the betterment of their communities. How, would, how does Tri-C stack up with your counterparts around the country? Uh, you know what, you have to ask them, uh, quite honestly. Well, you, because, you know them all now. I, I know them all, I know them all. Uh, and you but, worked at half of them. But you know, <laughs> I, I, I would tell you, but we have so many of my colleagues in the room that if they think we had reached the zenith, then they would feel that they perhaps have more, no more work to do. <laughs> but we are, we are, quite honestly, among the vanguard community colleges in the nation. 
when you think about the League for Innovation in the Community College, which is uh, uh, an organization comprised of 21 of the most um, innovative community colleges in the country, we are one of those. Uh, we, were, we were founding members back in the, in the 70s. Uh, we are also highlighted uh, as an organization that has uh, developed innovations in technology and instructional delivery. And in fact, uh, about two weeks ago, we were recognized by the Community College Research Consortium uh, with the report uh, on how well we're doing with our pathways. And the pathways are designed to ensure that students have a map and a, and a way to uh, complete their education in a timely manner. So we are, and we graduate, um, um, we are number one in the state in terms of nursing graduates and health career graduates. We're number five, I believe, across the nation. Um, we do very, very well in the technology areas and we're competitive in that regard. And we're much more competitive in the manufacturing area as well. And we are competitive also in transfer. So we, we stack up pretty well. One of the things we do need to work on, even though we have our graduation rate up to a meaningful level, we still have some ways to go in that regard. We're at 21% now, we'll be at 23% next year, but the average among community colleges is 25%. Somebody's saying, uh, see, when I announce these graduation <laughs> rates, particularly in the future, I get this, this sideways look because uh, uh, I'm always challenging them to do better. Uh, the other thing that we have to do is make sure that we, um, uh, students, regardless of their backgrounds, achieve at the same level. Our graduation rate is 21% overall, but when you take a look at those who may be economically disadvantaged or students of color, we still have some ways to go. Now, we've done well, but we have some work to do in that regard, and we are always very, very focused on doing that in, in a meaningful way. We have some of our students here, and they push me uh, to ensure that we put in place those things that will not only promote their achievement, but also uh, give them an opportunity to affirm their culture. So thank you for that <laughs> push. When, when you say that it's, uh, that it's 21% or 23% and, and climbing, that doesn't mean that 77 or 79% no, no, aren't no. ever graduating. No, no, we're talking about, so over a four to six year period of time, we graduate uh, between 60 to 70 percent of those individuals that come to us. Now you got to understand that folk come to us to community colleges for, for different reasons. They may not all be interested in a degree, uh, but we've got to make sure that we do a better job of ensuring that those who are interested in degree earn those degrees in a timely manner. And I feel like contextually it's important to remember too that you take everybody. We take everybody, but when we take everybody because that's our mission, right. but we also have to ensure that they can achieve their goals and objectives. And if it's a degree, that's great. If it's a certificate, that's important. If it's a credential, that's important. Some folk come to us, they just want to take one class. Mm -hmm. I had a gentleman who called um, uh, yesterday while I was on IdeaStream and said, look, I needed 24 credit hours to improve myself and be promoted on the job. He talked about his experience at Tri-C. And more importantly, he talked about the great professors that he had, including Aaron Altos, who was one of our math faculty members at the Eastern Campus. So, as I indicated to you, the graduation rate is an important measure of, 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 of achievement and quality. But students come to us for, um, uh, for different things. And rather than looking at the graduation rate, let's look at the graduation number. Uh, Ten years ago, we graduated 1,800 students on a, a larger student base. This past year, almost 4,300. That's impressive. 4,300. Very impressive. Yes. We're going to uh, move to Q&A with the audience in a, in a second, but I wanted to ask you about a part of your work at Tri-C that's really important to me personally. Um, and I mentioned before that I serve on the advisory board to the Mandel Center for the Humanities, uh, the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for the Humanities. And I, it's important to me, that work, because I was an English major. We had a forum here um, with Annisfield Wolf in which literally to a person, everybody who asked a question identified themselves as a history major. These are like grown <laughs> yes. people, retired people. They're like, and I was a history major. And yes. So, uh -huh. um, but you have talked a lot about innovation 
and you've also talked a lot about preparing people for STEM careers. The humanities, there's always this sort of push-pull in the popular conversations around, around STEM versus the humanities, and uh, I want you to just put it all to rest it's not right a, now. It, it's, not a, it's, <laughs> it, it's definitely not an either-or. Um, uh, we don't focus on technical uh, training and programs at the expense of a liberally educated individual. Uh, and that is an important responsibility that higher education have, has that we cannot overlook. So the Humanities Center, uh, supported by the uh, Mandel Foundation, has a national advisory committee. It's made up of 10 stalwart individuals, including you, who represent the humanities in every way, shape, or form. Uh, one young lady in particular, Tia McNair, Dr. Tia McNair, is from the Association of American Colleges and Universities, and their primary focus is on creating opportunities uh, for individuals to engage in liberal education. But they also understand the importance of work. So as we think about the future of work, we have to uh, 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 understand that even a, although a lot of what we do is gonna be around technology developments and enhancements, it still requires us to ensure that individuals uh, are liberally educated so that they become members of the world of ideas and the life of the mind. And we can never overlook that at all. So um, I hope that put that one to rest for Thank you. you, sir. You Thank you very it. much. Dr. Alex Johnson, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. So to reset, I'm Dan Malthrop, Chief Executive here at the City Club. We're with Dr. Alex Johnson of Tri-C. He's been president there for many years. We're about to begin the audience Q&A, and we welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, and those of you joining us via our radio broadcast or our live stream, including apparently students from the Mandel Humanities Center today. Is that true, Dean? Is that, are they, they're watching? Yeah. Hey, guys. Okay. So if you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our team will work it into the program. Holding our microphones today are Communications and Outreach Manager Julia Wong and City Club intern Remy Orsanya. May we have our first question, please? Uh -oh. oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Well, I'm, in, I'm in trouble. He put me up to this. I know. I know. So, so I'm Akram Boutros. Uh, uh, thanks for uh, doing this. So in your book, you talk about managing as a leader. Could you just talk a little bit about that, what you mean by it? and why it's so important to do that. Yeah. So thank you, Ackerman, and thank you also for the great support that we have um, uh, uh, in a great partnership with Metro Health. I don't know if you know this or not, but um, uh, Dr. Boutros has led the transformation of uh, Metro Health, and it's going to have a significant impact on the development of the near west side of, uh, of Greater Cleveland. Um, Part of that effort is, is, is a request to us to work with him on creating an access center uh, at Metro Health. And um, uh, he, has, he and his organization have donated $1 million to that end uh, and for scholarships as well. So I can thank you for that. The no, I'm not dodging. Wait, I'm, only, I'm, only, I'm only giving you props, man. Yeah, Come a, on. What, what is an access center? Uh, what does that mean? Is that sort of a portal to get into to get to get into? Well, actually, it's much more than that, quite honestly. So, just briefly, and I'm going to get to your question, my friend. Uh, we have right now. We've established uh, two access centers, and those access centers are designed to place the college in the community. In the past, we've been very insular and we've uh, focused primarily on individuals coming to us. So these access centers are designed to provide individuals with the experiences that would help them understand the value of post-secondary education and training, and then ultimately to earn some type of certification that gets them into the workforce. And they can do that on site. The, the, the characteristics are as follows. Number one, long-standing relationship with the college, um, a constituency, um, a partner, a corporate partner, uh, and then space for programs. And those two right now are at Olivet um, uh, Community Development Center and also at Esperanza Incorporated. And the third one will be uh, at Metro Health. Excellent. So in response to your question, when you think about leadership, you're not, auto most people don't automatically go into a leadership role. They have to pay their dues. Uh, they have to uh, learn how to 
not manage people is not the term I want to use, um, manage projects and uh, understand the technical responsibilities that managers have. But you never um, um, get rid of those, uh, eliminate those once you get into a leadership role. You carry those things with you because in effect, they're the ones that catapulted you to the position. And sometimes as a leader, um, you don't micromanage, but you want to make certain that those things that are important to transformation, you have a direct hand in. So for me, uh, as a leader, it's around, um, it's around our access agenda, the pillars of access. So for example, I want to understand how the institution is connecting to the community. That's the first pillar. I want to know if we are increasing our conversion rate. Are we bringing more individuals into the institution as a result of that connection? I want to know to what extent uh, we are helping them uh, to learn, particularly in English and mathematics, which essentially are gateway courses into some of our programs. We want to retain them. Uh, in the past, we've measured retention from fall to fall and from spring, from fall to spring. But for our students, retention uh, is a responsibility that we have to carry it out every day. It's from course to course. It's from day to day. It's from hour to hour for some of our students. And the last thing we want to be involved in, I want to be involved in uh, in, a, in a, uh, an important way, is completion. How do we continue to ensure more students graduate uh, from our college uh, both quickly and, and efficiently? So there's some things that you want to insert yourself in uh, and be part of uh, because uh, as a leader, that's what you have to do. And you do that because you've already managed projects and you bring a certain expertise that people, uh, that people understand. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Merle Johnson. I'm on the Ohio Board of Education, and it's so good to have you here today, Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Merle. Um, I picked up a call and post at the Urban League of Cleveland, and I noticed your picture was on the cover, so I said, oh, I need to get this. <laughs> so um, there was a full-page interview in the paper. I read every word to prepare oh for, your, for your visit. Wow. I'm in <laughs> trouble now. And, well, there was something that was really surprising to me. You were asked... Uh, how it felt to be a leader, and you said, and, and I could be paraphrasing, that you didn't consider yourself a leader, you were a president of a, of a college. And so um, I'm just wondering what, what you meant by that. Okay, I haven't read the article, so uh, <laughs> let me, let me I said a lot during that interview because I think it lasted, uh, Stacy. I think it lasted a good 45 minutes to an hour uh, because they, I guess they had a lot of space to fill up, so. <laughs> But at any rate, um, I, I, I look at leadership a little bit differently uh, than what most people do. Um, I believe that leadership is not based on positional power, it's based on uh, relational power. And that the best way to be a good leader is to essentially inspire other folk to do the important work uh, at, at an institution. So in terms of uh, my leadership style, I tend to lead from the middle. And I believe that my primary responsibility is to have individuals like a Jeffrey Tuma, for example, who's seated in the audience, take on the important responsibilities that would ensure that together uh, we created a really, a, a really great uh, institution. So I'm a president because titularly, that's what I am. But I'm a leader because I believe very strongly that the responsibility to advance and transform an organization is everyone's responsibility, just like inclusive excellence and all of the other things that we practice at the college. So does that answer it for you? Yeah, yeah you gave me a chance to talk, okay. think about that one. Yes. <laughs> Next question. Hello, uh, my name is Shazab Malik. I'm a College Credit Plus student at the Western Campus. I'm also involved in Phi Theta Kappa and Institute Government. Uh, a lot of times when we look at the community college student body, the biggest issue is motivation. Motivation of self, motivation of getting to completion of the degree or whatever goal we have uh, near and dear to ourselves. My question to you is, uh, what gets you up in the morning and what motivates you to do the things that you do on a daily basis and on a yearly basis? Mm. Thank you. Wow, um, that's, a, that's a good question. It's gonna cause me to, uh, uh, to think about. 
Um, you know what I try to do, and I want to thank you so much. When you talk about College Credit Plus, uh, that means that he's still a high school student and uh, duly enrolled. What high school are you at? You're at Strongsville High School. Uh, how many credits are you taking this semester? Uh, currently, I'm taking 11 credit hours, and I'm, uh, I've completed 41 credit hours, and I'm going to be graduating with uh, Associate of Arts and Science in the spring. There you go. So, and I was, so, I, so he's graduating high school with an associate's degree. Yeah, well, he's, well, you know, oftentimes they graduate from college before they even complete their high school, right? <laughs> Is that happening to you? No, so I, I had a friend who completed their degree actually last year in the in the winter, and they're, uh, currently she's working at Cleveland State on her undergrad, and she's in my grade. So. Okay, wow. So, so you got competition. Strongsville is <laughs> is, is really a great uh, school um, with, with with respect to dual and concurrent enrollment. But so the question is, how do we uh, enrich and enliven the student experience to ensure that students are more engaged and uh, quite honestly, that was a difficult um, challenge, and it has been a difficult challenge for us. So what we've done is really look to the four-year model as a way to um, enliven the student experience. We want to make certain that students um, get uh, leadership development programming through student government. We want to make certain that they have uh, outlets, uh, including sports programs and the, um, uh, the, the uh, Triceratops, uh, um, um, yeah, was, uh, Stomp was, uh, was an outcome of that. We want to make certain that there's uh, a considerable interaction between faculty and students and staff and students outside the classroom, and we do that through a program called the Access Champion Program and care teams and things of that sort. So we're working on that. Uh, but we still have a long ways to go. And the, and the Mandel Scholars is another example in our scholars programs in general. Uh, but yeah. He, he asked you, those, those, are, those are all really interesting, but he asked you what gets you up in the morning. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought he had forgotten about it. So I've gone through, I've gone yeah, through he dual, might have, but I've I gone didn't. through dual and concurrent. <laughs> what gets me up in the morning? Okay, so every day, every day, and Stacy knows this and Barb knows this as well, I try to have something on my calendar that really, really like says, okay, I got to get there. I got to do this. So recently, uh, we've been working on our access centers, and I try to make all of those meetings. Claire knows that we have our levy meetings uh, on a regular basis, and I try to, I say, oh, get motivated for that. So there's certain things throughout the day that really get me up in the morning. But at the end of, the, at, at the end of all of this, it's about how do we make it possible for more students to benefit from the power and the value of a Tri-C education. And everybody in the room that knows me uh, on a personal level knows that that's my, that's my focus, and I'm always trying to figure out ways that we can, we can do that better. And a lot of what we've done, I've actually thought about it three and four o'clock in the morning, Dan, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about the, the comprehensive first year experience program, making that mandatory, piloting at scale, uh, working with Jeff and others, for example, on the President's Council to ensure that there's gave engagement at a meaningful level, and the list goes on and on and on. And that, I think that comes from um, students like the one that just spoke and, and the kind of, of, of uh, humility uh, that they demonstrate, a, demonstrate uh, each and every day and what they ask of us um, as professionals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question. Okay. Hello, Dr. Johnson. Hey, Nikki. How are you? Um, quick question. Um, like everyone, very excited about the opportunities that Say Yes presents to the Cleveland community. However, you know, there's only a few hundred CMSD students that matriculate to Tri-C every year. Um, I personally would like to see that number grow because Tri-C is such a great vehicle, I think, for, um, for a four-year institution. So how do we ensure that we can kind of keep that pipeline coming to Tri-C, increasing that pipeline, and then also ensuring that those students really aren't penalized by choosing Tri-C rather than going to Cleveland right. State? So I, actually, I should ask Angela Johnson, I don't know if she's in the room or not, to, um, uh, to answer, oh, there she is right there, to answer that question for you. Did you put her up for, the, for the that? No. <laughs> so you're going to have to help me with the answers. But actually, in the Say Yes program, we've increased our enrollment of CMSD students. I think last year, Angela, we were around 
200 or so that came without uh, Say Yes support, but right now we're, we're about 250. We're three, three, whoa, okay, so th we're 310, so we have increased as a result of Say Yes. And so uh, because our tuition is so affordable and Say Yes is last in dollars, we had to figure out a way to uh, provide an incentive for students to really come to Tri-C. And I think we've, we've established a program where some of those students will be getting $1,000 uh, stipend is that for the semester or for the year? A year, a thousand dollar stipend. Plus, they can delay the use of their say yes money until they transfer to a four year institution, which means that they don't have to borrow money or depend on federal aid like the Pell Grant in order to support their education in the last two years. So we have a we have we we're working on it, uh, and I think the important thing about say yes. And this is something that I think a lot of uh, cities that have promise programs can benefit from. You got, students have to have wraparound services. You just can't provide scholarship dollars and not think about the student's environment or the mm -hmm. things that they go through each and mm -hmm. every day. So uh, bus transportation, uh, support uh, to, to stave off insecurities like homelessness, <laughs> and food are important responsibilities that we have that uh, I think will support the Say Yes program in a significant way. And I want to uh, give a shout out to the Say Yes folk for the work that they're doing in that regard. You know, Thanks, Dr. Johnson, Nikki. I want to clarify something for, I mean, I know the folks in the room here are pretty familiar with Say Yes. We've right. done a lot of forums about it. Folks who are listening may not know that, you know, what it is, this comprehensive program right. that's 120, 130 million. We've, um, the community is raising. It's raising, um, and it's at ninety-two it's million, at 92 which, million is, which, right is, now. which is a big chunk of money. That yeah. is not small. No. Um, uh, to provide scholarships for students in the Cleveland Metro School District and wraparound services right. to help the, take care of everything, so that they're able to succeed. And lest anyone in the room or listening thinks that a thousand dollars stipend is like too much. The other day when I bought this handsome baseball hat right. with the Triceratops on it at the bookstore at the Metro campus, the woman in front of me in line was buying a book. It was $400. It was a single book for $400. I don't know what class she was taking, but um, that'll eat up your $1,000 stipend pretty quick. Yeah, it, and it will. And quite honestly, let me just say this to you. Um, because we know that the costs associated with education in some instances are just out of range uh, for a lot of our students, we've implemented a lot of free online educational resources. Mm -hmm. And we've been able to save, I think, somewhere between 12 and $15 million uh, in book sales over the last couple of years. So last three or four years, David is here, Koontz is here, so he would know better than I, but that's, mm -hmm. that's a big deal. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Do we have another question? Another student. Hello, yes. Dr. Johnson. Hey. Um, my name is Yuda Yamamoto. I'm a vice president of student government East, Eastern Campus, and uh, I'm an international student uh, from Japan. Um, uh, first of all, I really thank um, Dr. Johnson to be, be a really good um, president of the campus of the uh, I'll, I'll take that. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, last year. Uh, we, we had an opportunity to talk to Dr. Johnson, and I asked, um, we, I feel there's an um, isolation between ESL student and Tri-C, and um, Dr. Johnson answered, uh, you, um, he, 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 um, you, you're going to bring it back and talk to the campus president, and I heard um, there's a um, multicultural center is opening ne next semester, right. so I am really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, um, my question is, what do you what do you expect to ESL student next? Okay. Oh, are you asking me for something publicly or what? I mean, uh, <laughs> both. No, but yeah, yeah, he said yes. Okay. So, um, um, we have increased our population of international students uh, and individuals um, um, who need English as a second language. Uh, uh, um, I mean. It, it, it's increased significantly, uh, particularly over the last three or four years. Uh, and one of the things that we know we have to do is recognize uh, the unique qualities and circumstances and culture that they bring to our institution and how they can help us transform uh, as an organization. Um, 
a lot of our international students are actually Mandel scholars uh, from throughout Asia, for example, and also Africa. Um, and, and that's an important opportunity, I believe. What we've done in response to uh, that concern is, or that challenge, is open up on each one of our campuses multicultural centers. And I had to help the students understand that these multicultural students are not just for people of color or people who may have a different set of circumstances, they're for everyone. And they're designed to do a couple of things. Number one, to give them an opportunity to affirm their cultural values, to pray if they need a quiet place to pray, for example, and then to allow individuals that have not had experience in a more pluralistic or multicultural environment to learn from them. So not only are they learners, they are teachers as well. And I think we have a name. We don't just call them multicultural centers, do we, Jenny? What's the name? Student Centers for Multicultural Engagement. Okay, Student, student centers. centers for Multicultural Engagement. Thank you. Before we get to the next question, you international students, I want to introduce you to Global Cleveland over here. You guys need to meet Joe Simperman, one another. Joe Simperman, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Johnson. Hey, how are you? I'm good. My name is Jade Inslee. I'm I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a part of the High Tech Academy program at the Metro campus, also a dual enrollment student. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, you have talked a lot about leadership this afternoon and your perspective on leadership. So my question to you is, what advice could you give to a young scholar like myself and others um, on leadership to instill within? Okay. So first of all, before I answer that question, let me just, just, just thank uh, Pat. Uh, Pastore for uh, his support of the High Tech Academy. I don't know if you know this or not, but the High Tech Academy has been around now for, I think, 20 years, if I'm not mistaken. It was, it was established uh, through a, uh, a very generous donation at the time from National City, and PNC, since they've acquired National City, has continued uh, to support it. So I want to thank you and Michael uh, for the work that you have allowed us to do with these, with these young students. So. Um, uh, the High Tech Academy is a dual enrolled program. So Jay, right, is still in high school. Uh, and I talked to her just about two weeks ago, and our hope is that she can continue her education at North Carolina A&T State University in Greensboro, historically black college and university. Um, yeah, I, I think from my perspective is that don't worry about becoming a leader. Think about accruing the experiences in the education that would ultimately single you out as a leader. And in that regard, uh, you, you're prepared for any eventuality. So what I would say to you and your, your, um, your classmates in the High Tech Academy is to keep on striving for excellence. And as you strive for excellence, everything else will fall into place. For me, I never coveted a college presidency. But other people, uh, when my time came, thought that perhaps it was a role that I, I could uh, fill. And I got a call um, from Carol Cartwright. How many of you know Carol Cartwright? From Kent State University, uh, who was my doctoral advisor. Uh, and I was at Winston-Salem State University as a vice president. She called, she said, Alex, there's a, a, a college a presidency opening at Cuyahoga. Would you be interested in it? And I said, wow, me as a college president? I said, and so eventually I got back to her and I said yes, and the rest is, is history. But continue to strive for educational excellence. Get as many experiences that you possibly can. Look around this room. There may be people in here like John Scorey and Joe DiRocco and Nikki Jaworski that you, whose behaviors you want to emulate. I certainly do. And then use those as a basis of your leadership and then begin thinking about all of the technical skills that you need. For example, work on your emotional intelligence. How do I engage an organization? How do I create a vision? How do I develop strategic plans? How do I measure the effectiveness of the organization? So those are the things that I would uh, encourage you to learn about. Do we have time for one, one more brief question? Good afternoon, Dr. Johnson. Good afternoon. My name is Noel Contreras, president of the student government no, Western good. Campus. Good seeing you again, my friend. <laughs> um, me as a foreigner from the Dominican Republic, I seem to try see like a good, <clears throat> sorry, a good opportunity for foreigners to learn and everything. But also as an American college student, 
I haven't seen a pattern in the procedures of the American um, educational system. So as a leader of my campus, I've been trying hard to make everybody to enjoy Tracy as well as I'm doing it. But sometimes we as a group, we face limitations. Sometimes federal limitations, sometimes school limitations, professor limitations, faculty limitations. And we got frustrated. For example, one of those limitations that we're facing right now for all the student governments on all the campuses is that um, any year student government goes to Washington DC for um, an event called ASAC where all the leaders of all the community college go and meet together to discuss the problems like Pell Grant, um, um, DACA, Dreamers, students, internationals that can't afford college and everything. But this year we got a limitation of just sending two representatives for each campus. We don't really agree with our rule, but we had to follow it. So my question would be, you as a Tri-C president, what could you do for us as a students that are trying to succeed in college under the rules that we are being imposed? Yeah, and so are you talking specifically about uh, your status as an international student, or are you talking about the travel uh, where you were, um, where only two people from each campus uh, no, I'm talking DC. more about those limitations that were being imposed for us, not only me. Because we as a Western campus, we could just send two people to that trip when any year we were supposed to send all the members, yeah. including senators, presidents, vice presidents. Right. And I'm pretty sure that Eastern campus have the same rule, West Shore campus have the same rule, yeah. Metro campus have the same rule, and I'm pretty sure that most of them, most of them are not going to be in agreement. Right. Okay, so I, I, I got your question. So um, it may have been, uh, the reason may have been is that it was, it had become prohibitive from a, uh, from a, a cost perspective, but I'll tell you what I'll do. Uh, let me uh, get with the presidents of each one of those campuses and kind of talk through this so uh, maybe we can set aside more funding uh, to do it. Or maybe there was a limitation based on the number of individuals that could register for the conference or visit the White House. I really don't know. Give me an opportunity to investigate it and see uh, what we might be able to do to ensure that more individuals come. Okay. And with that fantastic example of advocacy and leadership, <laughs> um, we're going to close out the forum. Uh, today, we've been enjoying a conversation with Dr. Alex Johnson, president of Cuyahoga Community College. Our forum today is the Mandel Endowed Forum in Higher Education, made possible by a generous gift from the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Foundation. We're honored to have Chairman of the Board, Steve Hoffman, and Special Assistant to CEO and President Yehuda Reinhardt's Joanne White with us today. We appreciate the Foundation's longstanding support of the City Club. Our forum today is also part of our Local Heroes series, sponsored by Citizens Bank and Dominion Energy. We're delighted as well to have Indeda Letson from Citizens Bank and Ben Kreck from Dominion Energy with us today. Thank you so much for your support of City Club programming as well. And Dr. Johnson is also here as part of our Authors in Conversation series, supported in part by the residents of Cuyahoga County through a public grant from Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. We are grateful to all the residents of Cuyahoga County for their support through that Thank public you. grant. We also welcome guests at tables hosted by the following organizations, Burton Bell Carr Development Incorporated, Cleveland Clinic, Cuyahoga Community College, Global Cleveland, the Metro Health System, and PNC, as well as students from Wycliffe City School District, and a special welcome as well to the many Tri-C students who are with us today. Support for student participation in City Club forums comes from the William M. Weiss Foundation, with additional support from donors you'll find listed in our program today. We thank all of you for being here. That brings us to the end of our program. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Special thanks. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so there's, you're getting a standing ovation. I got the wave, right though. I got the wave. He's trying, to, <laughs> trying to slow it down. Dr. Johnson, <laughs> ladies you, and gentlemen, our you. forum is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. That was excellent. For today. information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund.
with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.